Uh, so good afternoon. I hope you enjoyed your lunch. Uh, so what we want to do with the panel today is to give you a solid understanding of the key principles and requirements to help you in your journey to navigate the regulatory pathway. Our panel will be providing a critical analysis of the routes to market for the EU and UK. We will also discuss about notified bodies and also look at some of the potential considerations for medical device. So first, let me introduce you to our panel. So after nearly a decade of working in the healthcare sector, she moved to the MHRA, working within the medal division for over eight years. In her first role as Deputy Director for Innovative Devices, she led the development of future UK regulations for medical devices following Brexit and worked with cross-government policymakers, interacting regularly with ministers and decision makers. Prior to that, she was Head of Clinical Investigations and Evaluation at MHRA. She represented the MHRA at the EU level for clinical investigation and evaluation and she's also led the implementation of the EU MDR and IVDR for clinical investigations and evaluation in the UK. A warm welcome to Dr. Camilla Fleetcroft. So she has nearly 25 years experience leading international teams, driving global and international clinical research programs. She post-graduated in medical device <laughs> regulatory affairs and has experience in post-market clinical activities within the medical device industry, such as Terumo Aortic. She supports medical device manufacturers and challenges the application of MDR. And a, a very warm welcome to Dr. Florence Longueville. So let's get started. Um, so first of all, we're going to um, just talk about some of the uh, considerations for classifications. So Camilla, um, how do you define classifications today? So it's uh, very similar to how it was under the directives. Um, and it's really uh, the first critical step so what we have is Annex 8 of the MDR, uh, and what you see there is a classification rules based on intended use, uh, characteristics, and inherent risks of the device. There are still the four main categories that we know and love. Uh, class 1 is your low risk, up to class 3 is your higher risk. Again, we have those subdivisions. You've got your class 2B implantables. Again, not, not unfamiliar. Class 1 sterile measuring functions, and now reusable surgical instruments as well. Like I said, you'll find the classification rules in Annex 8. We now have 22 rules, so a bit of an increase with the new regulation. And these are split into four quite distinct uh, sections. You've got your non-invasive devices, which are rules 1 to 4. Uh, you have your invasive medical devices, which are rules 5 to 8. Uh, your active medical devices, again, rules 9 to 13, and finally, your special rules, 14 to 22. I won't go through all the special rules, but some of the things they cover are if a device has an integrated product that, when alone, would be considered a medicinal product, those used for contraception and preventing the tr transmission of sexually tr transmitted diseases, those used for disinfecting, cleaning, sterilizing medical devices, uh, those for recording diagnostic images from X-ray radiation, nanoparticles also make an appearance, as do uh, devices using human or animal tissue Great. Der derivatives. Great. Excellent, Camilla. So what does that really mean, Florence, in terms of conformity to MDR? How, how does this all kind of translate and apply to the classifications here? Uh, so um, the, the, the rules uh, to uh, uh, support the classification of, uh, of medical device um, are uh, set um, on very specific criteria, and, uh, and those uh, criteria uh, uh, are used to um, classify the, uh, the, the, the medical device, but also uh, just also uh, to... Um, um, uh, to, to, to provide this... Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, so, so no problem. So I, I'm going to just quickly ask a question to the audience. Uh, how many of you are developing a class three today up there? Okay. Okay. Uh, and, so, and class 2A or class 2B? Okay, so, uh, yeah, so a, mi a mixture here out Anyone there. Anyone not sure? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yeah, so, okay. so um, the classification is found in um, uh, all the MDR so, and, and direct the um, essential uh, requirements, so safety and performance requirements. Uh, also uh, address the uh, process that you can choose for the uh, notified body uh, evaluation of your, uh, 
of the conformity to the MDR, but also the document that you have to supply it for, uh, for, for the notified body. So the classification is a very, uh, uh, is a very key topic and is fined through all the MDR to, uh, uh, to, to evaluate uh, your, uh, uh, your uh, medical device. So, um, I would like to focus also maybe on the uh, notified body yeah. process. So, um, the, the, the higher uh, your um, medical device is uh, at risk, and the, most, um, the, more, uh, the evaluation from notified body would be uh, detailed and accurate. So for example, for class one, the, uh, there is no uh, notified body involved in the evaluation. So it's an auto self-certification from the manufacturer, but uh, he needs to uh, provide to the notified body um, uh, access of, uh, of the documentation, at least from the uh, Annex uh, 1 to 3. Um, of the MDR, and, and then for the class three, uh, the, the impact is uh, 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 very huge on the classification because for class two be implantable and class three implantable devices, uh, a, a, a thorough, a complete and accurate um, evaluation is done for all the technical documentation that you have to provide. And, um, and it's done uh, device by device. So there is no way, uh, like for class 2A device, to have a, a, a sampling um, a review of your technical documentation. Uh, it's, it's a review for the class 3 by type. Um, and, uh, and it is very, uh, it, it is why it is so important and we insist and we really recommend that the, the, the first step is um, uh, uh, when you develop and you start with your prototype is really to have a clear understanding of the class of your device. Great. And so Camilla, over to you, what do you think would be the key market considerations for, um, for manufacturers today to get their product to market? Uh, so, once you have your classification and you've decided what that conformity assessment route might look like, um, you do have a few considerations in the process. We know regulation is a bit of a hurdle jumping exercise, so hopefully this list gives you an idea of some of the, the key activities you're going to need to do. So, as you, you can see, you've already done classification, you've picked your route. The next things are quality management systems. Think about it early on developing your technical documentation, uh, your clinical evaluation that will be part of that, responsible persons, uh, really important, post-market activities, uh, and also don't forget things like your UDI and your traceability for your product. So I was just going to... Yeah, just a quick, <laughs> quick question here, thinking about quality management, what yep. process in the medical device stage should, should that be considered? Pre-market, at, at a very early stage, or fit for, when should that... QMS should be considered for a manufacturer. Um, so if you click on to the, the next slide, I think it's really important to understand that QMS is the underpinning uh, of your processes and, and can add real benefit to your company if done well. I would say as early as you can think about it. Um, we've got it here in that whole life cycle from concept through to post-market. It will really add value. Um, 13485 is obviously the a well-known standard, and I'd never think it's too early to review it, understand the principles, particularly if you're going to have to go through certification to that particular standard. Good, good. And going through the sort of the, the post-market consider, the life cycle piece of this, what do you see as the PMCF requirements and what exactly do they review? So if we're looking at sort of the the, the, life, the whole life cycle here in the post-market side, yeah, for example. Yeah, so what's, what's interesting and different slightly about the MDR is the real focus on uh, explaining and detailing clinical evaluation and post-market surveillance and post-market clinical follow-up. Um, you've got a slide here that shows you the different sections of technical documentation, and in section six around your verification and validation, that's where you find the documentation around your clinical evaluation report and those PMCF activities. It's vital that you understand your clinical development plan, where you're going, what you want to do. This document is about demonstrating you meet not only the um, general safety and performance requirements that you've identified, you should also document the ones that don't apply and why. 
Uh, and this is where you want to be building that really strong, scientifically robust data set that says, my device is safe, it performs, and it does what it's intended to do and provides those clinical benefits. It's an ongoing process. I'm sure you've all heard that endlessly. This is not a one and done approach. This is not one document that stops at market access. This is a document that you update, you feed in data through that post-market work, whether it be PMS or PMCF, and you continue to build that picture, learn about your product, learn whether the benefit risk ratio is still acceptable, identify any unknown risks, uh, any new contraindications you might have missed, or indeed off-label use. We know in historically and currently clinicians often will use devices not quite in line with their intended use and instructions for use, and it can help identify that. It really builds that real-world picture of how your device is used and, and what it's doing in the real world. Yeah, great, great. So, Florence, just moving on to clinical investigations here, yeah. what sort of evidence do manufacturers need to collect for, for their device, and where does this begin? Uh, is it the life cycle of the device? So, perhaps you can just share a little bit about, about that. Okay, so uh, for the uh, what kind of evidence, I would say it's evidence to uh, prove and to support the uh, allegation from the uh, manufacturer uh, regarding the intent purpose of the device. So in terms of performance, clinical uh, benefits, uh, clinical uh, safety and, uh, and uh, and uh, patient uh, mm -hmm. clinical benefits. So it, it's um, uh, it's the, the the data that have to be um, uh, collected through a clinical investigation. So a clinical investigation is um, uh, a, a process involving at least one uh, human subject uh, using the uh, medical uh, medical device. Um, so this means that um, it can be done uh, and performed through the complete life cycle of, uh, of your uh, medical device. Uh, of course, um, the first step is to plan your clinical investigation during the clinical uh, development the, at the very early stage of your clinical development. Um, not probably with the prototype, but as soon as you have collected some um, a preliminary results uh, in vitro or in preclinical data on animal, and you go in the first in human, you go through a clinical investigation. So the clinical investigation are uh, um, covered in a, in a specific uh, sh chapter in. Uh, uh, in the MDR and uh, deeply reviewed with the uh, Annex uh, for uh, 15, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, and um, there they are several categories. So the, the categories are for the, if it is to demonstrate the conformity uh, and then get uh, your device C mark, or if it is uh, after the C mark, so has a continuous uh, uh, process. Uh, you have to know that the classification of your uh, medical device uh, is also um, uh, driving the investigation and your clinical development plan uh, because uh, the clinical investigations are mandatory for a class 3 device. Um, unless you meet some very specific condition, you are allowed to not perform uh, such clinical investigation for class three, but you have really uh, to uh, pay particular attention. So it's very specific conditions. Um, it's uh, for certain legacy device or similar devices or upgraded version of your device, but really pay, pay attention because the justification must be very accurate and detailed, over your, otherwise uh, your uh, clinical evaluation will be uh, uh, rejected by the notified body. So um, uh, I, I would say on a general point of view, clinical investigation, there are lots of things to do regarding yeah, clinical yeah. investigation. Yeah. Um, you, you, you also uh, have to... Uh, to know that during the, 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 the design of uh, the clinical investigation um, might be different regarding the step, uh, if it's uh, uh, 
a pivot, a pilot, uh, a cohort, a registry, uh, and it's, um, but clinical investigation, it is, uh, it, it is uh, K for the clinical evaluation. And we have the so-called um, uh, other study that are covered by the article um, 82 of the medical, uh, of the MDR. And uh, those studies are um, observational without any uh, additional procedures or no uh, burdensome procedures of, uh, of your patient. Uh, so this means basically it is uh, really observational and registry. So, yeah, it's... Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's excellent. Now, there's been a lot of talk about the MDCG and the guidance documents for MDR. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so what, some of it's quite a little bit controversial, I'd say, but what would you say is the, the role of, of, of these documents for gu as a guidance document for your medical device development? How does, how does this play out? Okay, so, 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 so the MDCG, this uh, Medical Device Coordinating Group, um, is, um, uh, has different role. Um, and uh, the, the, the role that they can, uh, that they have uh, to support manufacturer, but not only manufacturer, and they support also a notified body, uh, it's uh, to deliver um, uh, guidance, uh, working, work instructions, templates, um, in order uh, to have a, a better understanding and a concrete understanding of what is expected with uh, uh, from the stakeholders of uh, medical device to uh, transition to the MDR, but also to uh, apply uh, uh, the, 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 the MDR uh, within, within your company. So the library um, is a huge source of, of information. Um, in addition to that, uh, the MDCG with the uh, European commissions um, designed and uh, put in place um, an expert panel. And this expert panel um, role is very important. It is um, um, clinicians uh, with the last update um, uh, approach, clinical approach, scientific approach in a specific field. So they have been categorized uh, uh, per their uh, field of expertise, um, and they they can be uh, they can participate to um, uh, to the conformity or, or, or to support manufacturer uh, and the and getting the C mark at several level. The first level is that manufacturer of class three or class two B uh, medical device. Uh, can request the expert panel advice uh, prior uh, the um, clinical, um, collecting clinical evidence. So this is uh, just asking for an opinion. Could you help me in my strategy? What should I focus on? Um, I, am I on the right way? Um, do, 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 do I understand uh, the requirements? And, and then the expert panel provide an opinion, provide an advice. Uh, this should be, uh, of course, documented in, in a domain. So this is the tracking record of all, uh, of all your uh, devices. So, so I just want to intervene there a little okay. bit. It's a little bit controversial, I've heard that some of these decisions these panels are making the last few weeks in terms of the, the level of scrutiny for the yeah. device, what, what, what can you share about that? Yeah, uh, alors, so, so it is not um, on, on the opinion that uh, the manufacturer uh, uh, can request prior the clinical um, uh, uh, development of the device. Um, the, the controversy comes from the, um, uh, uh, the a parallel evaluation of this expert uh, okay. panel uh, dur uh, during the um, uh, request for uh, conformity, so the request of, uh, mm -hmm. of uh, C mark, and um, so the, the notified body uh, perform their evaluation, uh, uh, provide the, um, the report, then the expert panel uh, mm -hmm. provide its report. Um, sometimes there are uh, different opinions. Um, 
you, you knew the, 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 the first report uh, from expert panel was issued in July 2021. Mm -hmm. To date, six has been issued, so it's not as much. Um, so when you look at the report, um, I would say that the notified body are really focused on the clinical evaluation uh, for the conformity to MDR and they get the C mark. When, um, but, but when you uh, look at the conclusion of the expert panel, they have a, a very high level expertise and opinion regarding your, uh, a, a clinician point of view of your, uh, of your uh, clinical evaluation. So for example, they recommend to manufacturer to have more uh, long-term follow-up. Um, so I would say it's not as much controversy. I would say it's, it's rather di different uh, point of view sure. regarding yeah. uh, clinical innovation and, and recommendation okay. and have, have more okay. uh, detail. So just talking with the manufacturers today, I mean, there is some challenge to get a notified body in the first place. The resourcing challenge, yes. <laughs> you know, and I've talked to many people and they, they still can't find a notified body, you know, uh, for their company. So. The MDCG has recently provided some new guidance uh, around um, around sort of SMEs and, and uh, how they can work with Notify. Can you just share a bit of light on, on that and how Manifest yeah, um, helped? So MDCG uh, provides a position paper, um, uh, uh, several po po position papers, but they are not the only one. Um, uh, you know, the uh, Competent Authority for Medical Devices uh, did the same. Uh, also some uh, professional association like uh, the SNITEM in France or the BVMAID um, in, in Germany or the team in NB uh, as well. Um, they are all warning um, about the issue that notified body are, are currently facing. Mm -hmm. The number of the notified body has drastically decreased uh, with the MDR application. So from more than 50, uh, they decrease to less than 20. We currently have 32, so that's, mm -hmm. that's good. But this means that the resource to get the conformity um, is not here. I mean, yeah. uh, it, it, is, uh, it, it is complicated. And, um, and, uh, and the notified body must also face to lack of preparation of manufacturers. So what I would advise to manufacture is really to uh, be properly um, uh, support with your CMARC um, uh, request. Mm -hmm. it, it, is, it is very important. So there are um, probably many things to do on a manufacturer point of view, mm -hmm. also on um, uh, not, uh, notified body point of view, so to mm -hmm. get resources, to train resources, um, and, uh, and probably at European level for those legacy devices, which are mm -hmm. the, the, the critical point, because we are waiting, I would say, uh, hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands uh, certificate to be released for the legacy device uh, within the next uh, 18 months. So that's, uh, that, that's, yeah, that's yeah. So, so very, yeah, yeah. very Yeah, so I just kind of go on to that topic quickly before we move on to the final topic. What is the crunch point here? Because, you know, we got May 2024, there's, you know, a deadline for recertification. Yes. What is actually happening today to, to try and alleviate that? Because we're heading for a bit of a, you know, well, disaster um, there. Currently, <laughs> I would say every day, uh, some uh, legacy devices are not allowed anymore to, uh, to, to be on the European market because they lose their uh, MDD certification and mm -hmm. they... Uh, and they, they, they don't have the MDR certification. So uh, recently, uh, the MedTech published uh, um, a Team NB um, mm -hmm. uh, article. I think it was from the director of the TMB, and uh, they, it is very well. It very well illustrates the, the, the situation because. Uh, uh, th this lady, she claims for uh, a generic uh, uh, a transition and, and a certification of, a, uh, of legacy device for one year. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and this is, I would say, a, a general warning and, and a request for, uh, sure. from professional association. Yeah. 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 yeah, so the warnings are out there. 
So we've got a few more moments. I uh, just want to kind of get Camilla now to touch on the UK. We're in the UK here, the Brexit. How, what's the implication for um, the manufacturers here in terms of how to adjust to the Brexit and the uh, you know, specifics of the situation here with a device today? Yeah, of course. I think everyone knows it's a difficult and uh, slightly complex situation. So for the UK, uh, in terms of regulation, it's broken down into Great Britain, which is Scotland, Wales and England, and of course Northern Ireland. Under the rules for Great Britain, uh, the UK MDR 2002 has remained on the directives level that was already uh, transposed into UK law. But because of the Northern Ireland Protocol following the exit from the EU, they have automatically uh, taken on board the EU MDR and IVDR, and indeed they are already in force. Uh, and the UK government has made legislative changes to make that happen. Um, so I won't go through it, but you've got two, two clear routes at the moment. Either you get your CE mark or you get a UK CA mark to be on uh, the UK market. Both fine until July 2023. Uh, not a lot of time until then, uh, at which point, in theory, you will need a UK CA mark to be on the Great Britain market. Um, those of you uh, who are interested in the UK regulations will know that the MHRA published a very extensive public consultation uh, in September last year, and it closed in November. They responded in June this year, uh, and we see a lot of alignment with the EU. Uh, that's hard to avoid, um, but also some differences where they're looking to really strive forward and make a regulation that is more agile, it's more robust, and indeed looks to be very globally leading. Um, there are some key, key topics that I think are of real interest, and that's of domestic assurance routes, which looks to whether there could be an abbreviated assessment by notified bodies for recognised jurisdictions. Uh, and whilst the MHRA do not specify those jurisdictions, the general thought is that would be like the likes of FDA, maybe Health Canada, and of course the EU. Um, we await further drafts of the legislation. We've only got the response so far. Um, but like I say, as, as far as we're aware, the July date next year still stands. Um, but thankfully, the MHRA and their response set out that there will be a transition for people on the Great Britain market. Uh, and there are three categories of that. Anyone who has a UK CA mark before the implementation of the new regulations can stay on the market uh, either until their certificate expires or for three years. Uh, those who have a CE mark under the directives, equally, they have to be on the market before the regs come into force, which of course they would be, uh, and they have until their certificate expires or three years, whichever is sooner. And the final category is uh, really interesting and actually I think adds to the most value is that those who CE mark under the EU MDR can be placed on the market any time in this transition period if they don't have to be on before the new UK regs come into force. Um, and they have up to five years or until their certificate expires again, whichever is soonest. So there is a bit of breathing so, room. So I'm going to ask you a question. <laughs> yep. um, if I'm a manufacturer today, would yep. it make sense just to come to the UK first, go through the process here and then go to Europe <laughs> because there's some period there of transition? Or uh, was that a... I mean, it really depends on your regulatory strategy and where you want yeah. to be. But certainly, at the moment, the UK regulations are based on the directives. So for yeah. those that perhaps would have a lower classification under that, they might deem it pragmatic to get that mark, sure. enjoy yeah. the transition period. Yeah. Um, but I think it's, it's really difficult because uh, we heard this morning people think it's extra cost for quite a small market. But like I said, I think it's, it's about the bigger picture. What can the UK offer in terms of development? Sure. The life sciences sector is really strong. Um, and I, I think the UK is an exciting place to start and to sort of invest in moving forward. But I completely appreciate what an awful lot of people have said to me this morning, is that there's a lot of unknown. Um, we, Like I said, we do not have draft legislation yet, so the exact details are, are not yeah. there yet. Yeah. Yeah, great. And then Florence, sort of wrapping up a little bit here, how is this all going to kind of plan out for the future here? How do you see this planning? Um, how to say the uh, planning? Uh, so, um, I mean, uh, the transition uh, is uh, coming to an end. So, uh, as a manufacturer, uh, you have uh, now it's not um, anymore uh, be ready or be prepared. You, you, you have to act and uh, and really uh, to, uh, to 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 ensure that the uh, uh, your, your transition period is complete, uh, you are compliant to uh, 
to the MDR uh, internally. You, you have in place the, uh, your quality management systems. You, you know um, uh, if you, you, you have to know if your device uh, class has been upgraded based on, on the MDR, and then you, you, you have additional requirements for, for your, your, your medical device, and um, proceed for clinical investigation. Um, uh, tomorrow, we, we, we have a, a session uh, regarding the reimbursement, um, and uh, maybe I can just introduce sure. that session. Um, in France, the, the reimbursement um, required uh, medical-based evidence. Medical-based evidence comes from clinical investigations. So if you can anticipate for your C mark, for your conformity to MDR for uh, a legacy device not reimbursed in France, uh, those medicine, uh, medical-based uh, evidence and get the reimbursed, um, that, 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 that's a very, very good idea. And not wait for the, uh, well, how uh, yeah. our session will discuss that tomorrow, but clinical data and clinical investigation are very important. Yeah, good points there. So, um, yeah, so let's, um, let's kind of wrap up a little bit here. Um, so maybe we can just kind of summarize really the topics we went through here today on the route to market. You know, we've gone through quite a bit here of content uh, for the audience. Um, so maybe start with you, Camilla. Maybe we just want to kind of summarize some of the points here, key points to look out for as a manufacturer today. I, mean, I, I think critically it's be methodical. Classification is, like we said, a very critical first step, understanding what you have in your hands and what your device does and what risk classification is really directs and dictates that journey that you're going to go through. Um, We've seen that it, it dictates how your conformity assessment will happen, but equally the extent of data required, the way you get that data um, is, is really important. And I think it's, for me, it's really important to remember that we always talk about a nice cyclical life cycle of devices, but that's not a smooth process. You will find that your journey is not just a lovely circle with arrows pointing from one box to another. There are lots of interdependencies. So you will jump backwards and forwards from various sections and processes. And again, that is why a good QMS is really important. Um, and just being very, uh, I guess, controlled and understanding exactly what you as the manufacturer need to do for your product. There is not one size fits all. This is about you learning and directing the, the journey for you and your product. Great, that's great. And Florence, any final remarks from you? Uh, um, I would say that um, um, the, the, this uh, MDR application can be, and can be uh, uh, seen as a very complex and complicated process. Actually, it is. Uh, but um, some companies are here to support you, so um, we, we, at Eclever, we, we have a, a strong board of uh, experts, we have regulatory experts, we have clinical trial experts that can provide you um, uh, support to uh, develop your uh, clinical strategy, uh, follow the uh, compliance to MDR, um, review with you uh, the uh, clinical evidence that you have uh, or clinical data that you have already connected and uh, tells you, advise you, uh, those these uh, clinical data are evidence regarding the safety, the performance, the clinical benefits. Is it what is required per the MDR? So uh, don't stay alone. Um, have uh, and, and request support from uh, professionals. Great, thanks for that lovely sum up, Florence. And uh, so um, let's just wrap up. So a big thank you to everybody here. Thank you to the organizers, LSI, Scott, and team. Uh, thank you to you, Florence, <laughs> Camilla, and thank you, audience. So I hope you enjoy the rest of the afternoon and have a good meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.